So far in our studies of projectile motion, we have not considered the effect that air friction might have. Today, we're going to take a closer look at that and see what happens. Before I begin, I'd like to just show you a few graphs that show you the difference between the predicted path of a projectile without taking air friction into consideration and the actual path of a projectile when you do consider air friction. Shown right now is the height of a skydiver falling from 1,000 meters. In the green, you can see the predicted heights for any moment in time if we do not consider air friction. Remember that with a position versus time graph, the slope of the graph tells you the velocity of the object in motion. If we look at the green graph, the slope is constantly getting steeper and steeper as time goes on, which indicates that the speed of the skydiver is increasing as time goes on. In reality, the speed of the skydiver does not continue to increase forever and ever and ever. The skydiver instead reaches a certain speed we call the terminal velocity, and at that point he doesn't speed up anymore. We can see that in the real graph of the skydiver's height, shown in blue, in this portion of the graph where the slope is relatively constant the whole time. In fact, we can calculate the slope if you'd like. It appears that uh, he falls the remaining 500 meters in approximately 10 seconds. And so the terminal velocity of the skydiver appears to be the change in y, or 500 meters, and the change in time of about 10 seconds, or approximately 50 meters per second. Here's another example. This comes from softball. The green graph is the predicted path of a softball without taking air friction into consideration. There, the only acceleration involved is the negative 9.8 for gravity. In the blue, you can see the actual path that a softball would take given the same initial settings. Notice it's significantly less. In this example, it's about two-thirds of the final distance. Let's be a little bit more specific. In the examples that we've studied so far, without air friction, the acceleration is constant throughout the flight. It's always been negative 9.8 the whole time. It's never changed. That results in trajectories or paths that are perfect parabolas and can be modeled easily using the position formulas we've already done before. They're relatively simple to calculate and to create graphs of. Unfortunately, when you're considering the path of objects and you're taking air friction into account, the acceleration varies throughout the flight. It is not constant. The trajectory the object can take can vary anywhere from a perfect parabola to a straight line. The resulting equations that we need are actually very complicated and usually require the use of differential equations, a concept that you'll probably learn about when you take math in college. Now let's talk a little bit more about that concept of terminal velocity. When you consider air friction, objects have what we call a terminal velocity that is a maximum speed that the air will allow them to move. Any object that's moving faster than terminal velocity will actually slow down. Once an object reaches its terminal velocity, a gravity will not be able to accelerate it any faster than it's already traveling. And you'll find that air friction actually decreases the rate of acceleration caused by gravity, so objects will fall slower than we predict them to. And they won't travel as far as we predict them to in a given amount of time. Since graphing the motion of these objects does require differential equations, a topic you haven't studied yet in high school, I've gone ahead and created a tool in Excel that will allow us to compare the predicted path of an object both with and without air friction being taken into account. I'll bring that up in a minute, but before I do, let's make a few predictions based on what would happen if a different type of softball was hit. First of all, make a prediction as to how you think the mass of the ball would affect the range or the total distance that the ball travels. Suppose the mass is bigger. How do you think that would affect the range? By the way, this should be affect, not effect. Affect is the verb and effect is the noun. 
Secondly, how do you think the area of the ball would affect the range? If all things were the same, but the area of the ball increased, how do you think that would affect how far it travels? Let's take a look. Here's the Excel file I created. A link to this file is on the website as well, next to the video. Anything in purple is an initial setting that you can feel free to change. Over here is just the initial settings of the shot. Here's the velocity and angle. And over here are some settings that have to do with air friction. The mass of the object that's traveling through the air, the density of the air, that is how thick the air is, how humid it is, or how dry, or what the temperature is. A drag coefficient, which for any sphere, I would suggest you leave as 0.47. And then the area of the ball, which I have currently as a formula. It's the radius squared times pi. Currently, I have the settings for a men's softball entered in, the mass of which is 0.187 kilograms. Let's explore that first question and change the mass. I'll increase it slowly and see what happens. Let's change it to 0.19 kilograms and 0.20 and 0.21. Notice the heavier the object, it appears that it's traveling further. In general, the more massive an object is, the more accurately its trajectory can be modeled without taking air friction into account. You'll learn when we study forces that the effect that a force has on an object is inversely related to the mass of that object. That is, a force does not affect a heavier object as much as it affects a lighter object. Let me change this mass back to what it was. And now let's adjust the area and see what happens. The area is conveniently 007 for James Bond. Let's see if we slowly increase this, what effect that has on the total distance. Let's try 0 0.008 and 0 0.009 and 0 0.010, 0 0.011. It appears that the bigger the area of the object, the less distance it travels, or the quicker that it slows down. That should make some sense to you. After all, a parachute is used to slow an object down, and parachutes have huge areas. Anyway, let me change the area back to what it was, and then we'll summarize our results and be finished. This is equal to the radius times radius times pi. So what did we find? We found the heavier or more massive a ball, the farther the ball travels. I should also say, however, that heavier objects will require you to hit them harder to get them to go to the exact same speed. So just increasing the weight of the ball is not necessarily going to help you hit it further. In fact, it will probably require more work to get it to go just as fast. But if you can get it to launch at the exact same speed as a lighter ball, then it will travel further. We also found that the area affects the range in the opposite direction. The greater the area of the ball, the less the ball travels. I hope this helps you understand the effect of air friction on projectiles a little bit more. Feel free to play around with the Excel file that's there and see what other things affect the trajectory of the ball. A useful question you might answer with that particular tool is what angle would be the optimal angle to hit a softball at for it to travel the furthest?